Welcome to Parenting Special Needs Live. I'm Shante. Today we will be talking with Elise Bossnight. She's going to be here to discuss the link between incontinence and Down syndrome, um, the importance of screening, steps to take if your loved one is experiencing incontinence. So um, Elise is a medical advisor to Aeroflow Urology. She's a provider of comprehensive sexual and reproductive health, uh, basic urological care and gynecological care uh, for Western North Carolina and the Southeast. And she opened her own private practice in June, 2020, Foss Knight Center for Sexual Health in Asheville, North Carolina. So please welcome Elise. Well, welcome, Elise. How Hello. are you? Thank you for I'm joining us. Good. Thank you so much for having me. It's my pleasure. So um, I appreciate it. I wanted to kind of start the conversation because uh, I know there was a recent study out, not that I'm privy to all of that, which I figured you are, and you can educate us about the, um, you know, the link between incontinence and Down syndrome. So can you start there? Because people yeah. might not be aware of it. Right. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so we know um, based off of the developmental delays that occur with Down's syndrome is that, excuse me, is that um, because of those developmental delays um, and the neuro connections that connect the, the bladder and those sensations with um, being able to uh, use the restroom and empty out your bladder when you feel the need to do that, those connections are delayed um, in those individuals that, that have Down's syndrome. And so when we think about normal types of urinary function, um, bladder function typically is um, set and um, kiddos have really good bladder function by the time that they're age six. So, you know, when we think about potty training and I have, you know, little kiddos and things like that, we, we push them so early, right, at their 18 months or, you know, two years. And I'm like, whoa, 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 wait just a second, um, that really they don't have full bladder capacity until they're aged around six. Hmm. So being able to think about that when we're, when we're talking about kind of those, those um, typical developmental connections that happen in the micturation center of your brain, those connections have to have a very precise harmonious relationship with one another for your body to recognize and your brain to recognize that you need to go empty your bladder and that you need to go to the bathroom. So again, those connections, again, fully capacity around age six. So when we're thinking about um, children that have Downs, um, we're thinking anywhere between probably eight to 12 um, is going to be that developmental delay of when those neuro, neuro, excuse me, neuron connections actually start happening, that they're able to have that capacity. And so I, I know that for a lot of parents, um, and when I was specifically just only in urology, and I would do a little bit of pediatric urology too, that was the question that came up a lot is, you know, why is this not happening as fast as what I, in my other children that, that don't have Downs? And so again, just being able to understand that the link that's happening there is just those neuro connections that are happening with those nerves um, and being able for those sheaths to start to develop so that that connection can happen and sending that signal to the brain for them to feel that need to go. Um, so again, we see this in probably, I would say around 60 to 65% of children um, that have Downs, again, between those ages of eight to 12, um, we're seeing that actually happening. And then um, uh, as we know how Downs progresses um, with the body and aging, we see that a lot earlier on too. So this is an incontinence that's happening um, that we see kind of for general populations in the 50s and 60s that we're seeing this even into their like late 30s, early 40s now. So there's a short window of time when functional capacity of that bladder um, you're able to hold and they might be dry. Um, a lot of times too um, with those folks that, um, that have Downs, um, they get so busy with everything else that's going on that they forget to pay attention to what's happening with their body. Um, and so being able to um, have those conversations about bodily functions and what does it mean to go to the bathroom and how um, it's happy, you know, it's a healthy process to be able to, be able to do that. Um, one of the other things too that occurs with urinary incontinence, again, for those folks with Downs, um, is the bowels. Um, and we know for a lot of kiddos that constipation can cause difficulties with emptying out your bladder. And so that can lead to urinary incontinence as well. So, um, so it's important to get screened, right? Oh I mean, gosh. What, what does, 
What does that look like? What does that look like? What's yeah. a screening? And when do you, and how do you know when to take your child? Yeah, absolutely. So I, I, listen, I'm a big advocate for just seeing a urologist um, right away. So, you know, because it's good to have somebody um, in your corner, somebody that knows your child knows what's going on. Because one of the biggest things that I have seen is that we just kind of poo poo it to the fact like, oh, it's just because they have downs and they have incontinence. And so we're just going to deal with it. But there can be other things that are going on. If there's some sort of tethered cord, some spinal cord injury, again, the constipation, if there is a pelvic floor disorder that's going on, um, we don't want to miss those types of things and just blame it on the fact that they have downs as a reason for them to have urinary incontinence. And it's those developmental delays that are happening. So when you go and get screened, one of the things that um, we can typically do is what's called a urodynamics study. And urodynamics is just a, a, a fancy term for a bladder function test. Um, it can be a little invasive. So I always recommend um, to talk with a patient ahead of time. What are we going to be doing? Obviously, if this is a kiddo, we want to use um, appropriate terminology that they're going to understand. But what we would do is we would place a tiny catheter into their bladder through their urethra. At the end of that catheter is a pressure electrode that's attached to a computer. And as we're filling their bladder up with fluid, so we're kind of doing an artificial bladder filling um, test is what we're doing. We, on our computer screen, it lets us know what's happening during that process and when their bladder is full and if it squeezes and they're not responding to us saying that they need to go. So it gives us a lot of information about how their bladder is actually functioning so we can rule in or rule out um, anything that might be a, a specific urinary cause or some sort of um, external factor that could be happening with that too. So that's okay. one of the things as far as, oh, sorry. I wanted to ask a question because I'm just trying to picture it. So yes. I'm, I'm visual. So I'm trying to figure. So the you guys are put pushing uh, fluid into the bladder. So I'm, I'm envisioning it like a balloon and it's filling yeah. up. Yeah. Okay. So they're not drinking to fill up that bladder. It's you guys are actually. So you're trying in this particular. I just want to make sure I understand. You're trying to make sure that um, they feel the sensation that it's full. Right. Correct. Yeah. And that they're making those connections between their bladder and their brain so that we're not missing anything like a neurologic bladder, meaning that it fills. It just doesn't have the capacity to squeeze. And so you can have overflow incontinence that happens. So we're trying to piece out what type of incontinence, incontinence do they actually have? And then that helps us to figure out then the treatment options going forward, because not all urinary incontinence types are treated the same. So are they going to the bathroom too frequently? Um, do they have significant urge and they can't make it to the bathroom? Again, are there certain neuro, you know, neuron connections that are um, uh, out of balance um, with that? Is this stress incontinence? So they're running or they're exercising and they're playing and they're leaking during that time too. And so and I, I try to kind of stimulate that process. So with that catheter still in place and that's filling, I'll have them stand up, I'll have them jog in place, kind of run around. So, um, you know, for the most part, they're kind of sitting in a chair with a, um, a device underneath that's going to catch when they do go to the bathroom. Um, so, again, we're kind of simulating what it would be like for them to normally fill their bladder up. And listen, it, I would love to figure out a way um, for them to, to wear some sort of contraption, you know, wear it for 24, 48 hours, like a heart monitor um, that they could wear at home so we could really see what's going on during those times. But unfortunately, science. Um, has not figured that piece out um, quite yet, but yes. Um, so that's a great way, way to do that, again, on the functional side of things. The other thing that we wanna make sure is that they don't have a urinary tract infection. So hygiene um, uh, concerns um, uh, can come up to uh, after they have a bowel movement um, or if the um, Down syndrome individual is a vulva owner. So if they have female reproductive parts and pieces, so, you know, we're thinking about hygiene and recurrent urinary tract infections um, that are going on there um, as well. Um, and so, again, having those conversations um, with parents, especially um, talking about wiping, uh, we can always just check a urinalysis um, on, uh, on them there in the office, which is really easy. We can also do a little ultrasound over their bladder in the office. So we can make sure that they're emptying out appropriately also, because that can be another cause of urinary incontinence as well. So I um, am curious, okay, so on a couple of things, and um, I know that we were discussing Down syndrome, but 
we kind of in our audience we cover like lots of different um sure. abilities and so actually my daughter has autism and she has had urinary issues and so um so could this also still be, I mean, I know some of the things you're talking about, she's had too. I mean, she also has the developmental delay portion. So it's, I know we're, we're saying Down syndrome, but it kind of could go across all of the disabilities, correct? Absolutely. Um, so, yes. our, so the same kind of test would be yep. appropriate. And, and I'm saying she doesn't have, with, I'll speak of my, my daughter, she's older, she's 24, but, um, but she always has to go to the bathroom and it's kind of like just, a, you know, I mean, I feel like she doesn't understand how to empty the bladder or when it's con completely emptied or whatever. So she always has that little feeling of going. So I like that out there that if you suspect what's the first steps, I mean, kind of to get screened, like where, what do they do? Mm -hmm. Yeah, gotcha. So when, once we get all of the information um, together, so we've collected a urine and we've ruled out the fact that they don't have a urinary tract infection. We're making sure, you know, we're checking to the functionality of their bladder and what's going on. Is it the fact that they, they can fill, but they can't squeeze? Or is it the fact that they can't fill and it just squeezes too much? So being able to kind of, again, piece that out, there can be some um, different um, conservative measurements that we can do a lot of times too, if the urine is too concentrated, and that can cause more of an, an irrita irritation and an irritant to the bladder to make it go more frequently. Um, so I know sometimes um, with those that have some developmental delays, just drinking water, right? They would rather, you know, drink BT or Cokes or you know, sodas and things like that. So making sure that they get plenty of water is going to be really helpful. And water consistently throughout the day, not just drinking like 20 ounces of water at one sitting, right? Because that fills up the bladder too fast. So anywhere between, you know, three and four ounces of water consistently on the hour can be super helpful just to can keep that water consistent. Making sure they're getting enough fiber so that they're not constipated. Again, bowels and bladder work harmoniously together. So if one is backed up, um, or there's too much irritation. Um, again, constipation is one that we see a lot um, for folks that have some developmental delays um, as well. So making sure they get plenty of fiber. Increasing water is gonna really help that out too to keep the bowels moving constantly. Making sure that they get enough exercise is gonna be important too. Jumping around, making those bowels move, um, and that can help the bladder out as well. Um, if those types of conservative measures don't work as best. The other thing that I, I don't think that we, talk enough about or utilize enough is our pelvic floor physical therapist. And so I work really closely with a pelvic floor physical therapist because a lot of what we're seeing isn't just the bladder that's causing the problem, but it's the pelvic floor. Now, some of our listeners, I'm sure today, and I can see like of your face, like <laughs> what is the pelvic floor at least, right? Well, I kind of know, but I'm thinking, okay, how do you do that with kids? Okay, go ahead. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And so your pelvic floor is, um, is like a basin in your pelvis and it's, um, comprised of anywhere between 26 and 28 muscles, depending on, on who you talk to, but um, about 26 or 28 muscles, and they're tiny, and they attach to your pubic bone in the front, they wrap around um, the urethra, they wrap around the rectum, they attach to the coccyx or the butt bone in the back, and then they fan out to the side. So they're literally like a basin in your pelvis, and there's three different layers to that, and they all function a little bit differently, but they relax and open up for you to be able to have a bowel movement, and to empty out your bladder, but they also want to stay um, strong so that you're not having the incontinence and not having um, bowel movements when you don't want them to either. So a lot of times it's not necessarily the connections between being able to have that bladder squeeze or have that bladder fill. It's more of a functionality when it comes to the pelvic floor. I don't think that a lot of us were taught how to actually have a bowel movement correctly <laughs> or how to pee correctly either, right? It's not a push. We don't have to bowel salvo. We don't have to hold our breath to, to push that out. It's more of making sure that we are um, positioned properly and you can use a stool for this by the, um, by the toilet. Um, I'm sure some of you all have heard about like the squatty potty and things like that. But it's being able to relax and open up those muscles and actually belly breathe. So you can teach your children um, some basic belly breathing exercises while they're on the toilet to help them evacuate their, their bladder better, but also to have better bowel movements. Um, and it may take a little bit of time to do that, but being consistent and talking with a pelvic floor physical therapist um, can be really helpful to do that. 
if we have to do some more invasive types of um, treatments for this pelvic floor disorders, um, obviously we wanna take um, a lot of precaution um, in any kind of touch to the genital area. So a lot of it's very consensual. A lot of the exam can be done with clothes on, um, which, you know, again, we can get a lot of benefit and a lot of information through that too. The other thing um, to think about also is if there's any um, lower back issues of, or abdominal issues that can impact the pelvic floor also, or if there are joint issues too, which sometimes we know can happen in our developmental delayed um, kiddos as well, um, whether the joints are um, hypermobile or they're too stiff, um, they're having other types of like arthritis that could be going on too, because um, the hips are part of your pelvic floor also. So again, it's all harmoniously working together um, to benefit those bladder and bowel functions and so that that can happen the way that you want them to. So let's just, let me just, I want to ask too. Okay. So for, let's say I'm, I'm a younger mom and um, I noticed that my daughter, my daughter or son is not holding. That's like kind of like first or not being able to hold. That would be my first little sign. Like, Hey, maybe I should, where do I start? Do I start like with the pediatricians and ask, and then maybe then get directed. Like, how do we know we don't get poo-pooed by the pediatrician? Mm -hmm, yeah. So, you know, because that happens. Like, when do we, how, what do we look for? Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, obviously having that conversation, yep, with your pediatrician is the, is the kind of the first step. Um, if you're feeling like you're not being heard by your pediatrician or you're feeling like, the, the next steps in treatment and assessment aren't um, working as well as you would like to. So a lot of times pediatricians can give you those conservative methods, right? Making sure that they're getting plenty of exercise and water and they're eating fiber and da 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 da. Try it out. And I, what I tell people too is if one method isn't working within a good probably six to eight weeks, you know, we've really got to be thinking about expanding and figure out what else is going on. Uh, again, when we talk about like the poo-pooingness of it, it's like, oh, come back in like four or six months and that's totally fine. But there could, again, there could be something else going on. And a lot of time, um, a lot of times we wanna make sure that we are optimizing those, those visits and that time that we're trying to implement things and we're, that we're giving it a good, a good shot um, to make sure that, that it is working. If we do that, you know, then go back and advocate and always make a follow-up. A lot of times, you know, with pediatricians, they'll say, well, just call us if it's not getting better. Well, life gets in the way. And before you know it, it's been six months and you're like, we're still having this issue. So always make that follow up. OK, is always going to be important. What I recommend keeping. Listen, there are so many cool apps now that um, you can have on your phone or on your computer that you can help monitor. And if your child is old enough and they're able to participate, that's another great way for them to um, see how often that they're going to the bathroom, um, how often are they, are they not making it to the bathroom. Um, some of the other things that the pediatrician might talk to you about is some what's called timed voiding. So right, instead of waiting until the last minute when their bladder is super, super full and they can't make it, let's say, okay, it's been three hours since they've gone to the bathroom last time. Let's push it back and let's try to have them go to the bathroom at two and a half hours mm -hmm. or at the two hour mark. Typically every two hours is a good time frame for being able to be hydrated enough to evacuate your bladder. Obviously at nighttime in the evenings and throughout sleeping, we're not drinking. And so we should be able to... Um, to sleep through the night. And that's the other thing is a lot of time of bedwetting um, comes up, you know, those conversations um, as well. So um, again, setting alarms, limiting of how much fluid they're taking in before bedtime. Again, all of those kind of conservative measures can be, can be really helpful. But at that point, if you're, again, if we're still struggling um, having incontinence, speak up and ask for a, a pediatric urology uh, referral. And a lot of urologists, kind of not basic urologists, a lot of urologists dabble a little bit in some pediatric urology. So they might maybe not be fully trained um, as a pediatric urologist. So, you know, for me, I'm a PA, um, I work in urology, um, but my urologist that I worked with um, loves kids and recognizes that we don't have enough pediatric urologists in our area, right? We're in a, where I'm from in Western North Carolina, um, we have limited resources. And so we want to be access, right? Access is huge. And so that's one of the things that we really wanted to advocate for our patients um, under the age of 18 is 
they need some place to be able to go to. And so we would do as much as we can. And so a lot of times you have those resources in your area. Call up urology offices, find out do you have to have a referral from your pediatrician. Sometimes you don't have to. Insurance is dictate that too. Um, so speak up for your kiddos and really advocate and say, you know, we've tried this, we've gave it a good go, and it's, it's still not working. What are our next steps? What do we do next? What's going on? Right. And then I also know that you're an advisor, right, for Aeroflow, and Aeroflow uh, can help them get product, like if their child was. Uh, so, so explain that because not everybody might not be familiar with Aeroflow and the. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. So Aeroflow um, Urology is a company that provides a lot of incontinence products. So that can provide um, chuck pads. So for beds at night, if bedwetting is happening, it can provide um, the incontinence underwear, um, the resources that you can have also. If your child isn't emptying out their bladder as well as we would like to, again, kind of a functionality type of, of process with the bladder, or maybe there's a neurologic component to it where they can't empty out all the way and that's causing incontinence. Some cathing supplies um, can be provided by Aeroflow too. And the thing about that also is that um, with the type of incontinence and the related um, developmental delays, depending on what your child has, whether it's Downs or autism, that sort of thing, a lot of that qualifies you for insurance coverage. So these aren't things that you have to pay for out of pocket, which is awesome. Because let me tell you, those things can get expensive very, very quickly. So don't feel like you have to struggle in order to pay for these incontinence products uh, for your child. Reach out. Um, you know, and I love Aeroflow because one of the things that, it, right, they're not in it just for, you know, a company or a business and that sort of thing. They're in it because of you all, because the need is there and the access. And so we really work very diligently and we have a lot of good um, resources within the company to help advocate for you, to call your insurance. They fill out the forms, they, like they make everything as easy as possible, which is so awesome. You can get it delivered to your door. So it's not like you have to go pick it up someplace. They'll go deliver it to you, um, which is really nice also. So being able to, to reach out to them too, if that need is there. And again, every, every family and every child is gonna be so different. So, you know, when we think about expectations also, um, that's really important to think about. We want to have as many good days as possible or as many dry days as possible. I can't, we can't necessarily get you um, to that perfection. And what does even perfection mean? Um, but you know, there may be some days where you're like, we're gonna go on vacation or we go on a long trip and we know that those habits that we've formed at home just are gonna fly out the window, right? So being able to have those extra products and those incontinence products that you would need for those times is gonna be really important also. Yeah, no, it's great. Well, I can't um, thank you enough. So I think um, I appreciate that your you know, willingness to educate us and share with us. And I think you provided some excellent um, tips and I really appreciate it. So, um, and advice. So thank you. I don't, but um, was there anything else that I didn't ask that you want to ask before we kind of sign off? You know, for, for me and the way that I operate as a provider, I'm always thinking outside of the box um, and making sure that you are thinking about any little thing that might happen um, on a daily basis that could be contributing to their incontinence. And how do we troubleshoot that? How do we modify those types of things? Um, and sometimes having somebody else come in and look at it from an outside perspective um, it can be can be really helpful. Um, you know, don't forget about a lot of times seeing like a PA or a nurse practitioner. They get a lot of I get the opportunity to spend a lot more time with my patients. I get to talk to them um, a little bit more. So reaching out to those um, types of providers, too, can be really helpful and beneficial. Um, but yeah, advocating um, and making sure that you're asking all of those questions about, you know, what else can we do? What are the other things? Um, and sometimes I think, you know, when somebody says, or a provider especially says, I just don't think that there's anything else that we can do, challenge that because a lot of times they may not know if there's other things out there for them to do. They may not know the type of diagnostic testing that we can do that, are, that is out there. So, you know, I'm always, again, an advocate of challenging that provider to say, no, really, what else can we do? How, what are the other things that we can do to make this better? No, I think that's a great advice. Very yeah. nice. That is terrific. So thank you. Well, it was wonderful meeting um, you and um, I appreciate you sharing this uh, knowledge with us. I um, greatly appreciate it. I think it's very important. So everybody, if your child is having an issue with some incontinence, uh, you might want to look further. So thank you. Yeah, and absolutely. I'm going to, we're going to sign off. I want to say um, thank you for being with us today on Parenting Special Needs Live. And 
in case no one has um, told you today, you are doing a good job. Uh, it's hard work. Be good to you. Um, and I'll talk to you soon. Bye.